In motorsport, we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst, which is why today we're replacing this old fire system. I want to start this video by saying thank you. Thank you for your support. This channel has had an amazing launch and it's exceeded my expectations. A lot of exciting things have come of it too. You might remember from the video where we did the deep dive on the car that three of these were built at the same time, but I didn't have a picture of the third. The current owner of that car has been in touch. This is what the car looked like when it was built and this is what it looks like now competing in hill climbs. When I was shopping for this car, I wanted something turnkey, and this is pretty good, but there's still a list of things I need to work through before I can drive it for the first time. I've had to be really patient, and in this video, we're gonna see the fire system update. I expected this to be part of a larger video on all the things it needed doing, but a few parts ended up being a little bit fiddly, so here we are with our own video. Now, if you know me, you know I'm gonna be making my own parts where possible, so look out for some 3D printing and some custom parts also CNC machined. I'm now up to the stage where I'm in the grind. That's because before I can drive the car, I've got a decent list of jobs that I need to finish. And one of those is updating the fire system. This was actually a bonus for when I was shopping for the car, but as it turns out, the tank is massively out of date and an equivalent tank to swap in is unavailable. For a quick summary of the system, we have the pressurized tank in the bottom. There's the little electronics box to my left when I'm driving. You click the switch on that to prime the system and then the red button that you can see just to the left of the steering wheel with the e-sticker will discharge the contents of the tank through some line into two nozzles in the engine bay. Annoyingly, the tank is still in the green and the system would probably still work, but I can't use it, and that's because it's a Lifeline Zero 2000 and the newest is the Zero 2020. Basically, the old design is obsolete and only the new one has been homologated and approved by FIA. Therefore, I had no choice but to drop the money on the whole new system. I hoped the new system would be close enough to the old one that it would be a pretty straightforward swap, but as you're about to see, that was quite a bit different and that's why this gets its own video. And it really wasn't long into the unboxing that I realized that pretty much everything that counts in the new system was incompatible with the old and I'd be in for a bigger job. Firstly, this flexible metal line that acts as the delivery system for the fire suppressant was actually a larger diameter than what was on the old system. So therefore, all of the nozzles and all of the line some of which was gonna be hard to reach, had to come out. The straps to hold the tank looked different, but were principally the same, as was this protective sheathing that goes over the line. The old and new tank looked roughly the same size, so I was really hoping that the new bracket matched the old bracket, at least with the mounting pattern, and it was gonna be a straight swap. Finally, the actual tank. Obviously, this one's blue, the old one's red, but the outlet is also on the side instead of on the end. And very importantly, it had the right set of dates on it, meaning it's going to last for years to come. The final item in the box is probably one of the most important. It's the installation manual, and it goes through each section bit by bit on exactly how it needs to be put into the car. So before you madly head to the comments telling me I should have done X or Y differently, remember, I have to follow this exactly, otherwise the car won't pass scrutineering or get a logbook. To compare properly, obviously I needed to remove the old tank and bracket from the car. Just four bolts to take out the seat and then easy access to these. With the two side by side, it's clear that the tanks pretty much have the same diameter, but the two brackets are incompatible. And maybe you're thinking I should have just used the previous bracket, but it's missing one important feature, these anti-submarine tabs. The newer safety standards dictate that they need to be there, as it will greatly reduce the chances of the bottle slipping out of position from a side impact. Therefore, the new bracket was a must. The chassis had some welded in tabs with some studs sticking up, and they didn't really line up with the new bracket. For this car, I'm looking to weld onto it as rarely as I can. It's gonna be a massive hassle. So my solution instead was to design and machine a carbon fiber adapter. If you've come over from the main teaching tech channel, you might've seen a video on just this a few weeks ago. And in case you haven't, here's the relevant snippet about machining the adapter bracket. After taking measurements, my first iteration was overly simple. I laser cut it from cardboard, and this allowed me to verify the mounting pattern for the new bracket, as well as check the alignment of the studs built into the car. I then developed the design over four iterations, producing each from cardboard, until I was confident that everything not only lined up, but there would be sufficient clearance for the mounting hardware to not foul on the frame underneath. This also allowed a quick mock-up with the tank in place, 
and that let me verify that the seat would still clear. This one was to be machined from 2mm carbon plate, and the only change I made from the prototype was adding these recesses for the washers to sit flush. This adapter bracket in carbon fibre is absolutely flawless, and the accuracy of those pockets is spot on, as the washers slot in better than I could have ever hoped for. The start of installing this one happened on the bench, as I had to attach the bracket to the adapter, and to do so I used these nylon spacers, which you'll soon see were essential in creating the clearance required to install the whole thing into the car. Here is the sub-assembly with the new bracket bolted to the carbon fibre plate, ready to go. However, it wasn't going to be that straightforward because the bracket mounting bolts were fouling on the frame. So I whipped out the grinder and added just a little bit of extra clearance, and that allowed everything to be installed without any gaps between the underside of the carbon and the top of the frame. Now you can see a large part of the reasoning for those nylon spacers, as I needed room to slip in spanners to be able to do up the lock nuts that attach the carbon plate to the existing studs in the frame. This was pretty awkward, but I got there eventually. If you're wondering how strong this is, the answer is plenty. As you can see, I can roll the whole car back and forth by the fire extinguisher bracket. Here's our finished part with the tank resting in place and still with enough clearance to the back of the seat. Back to this video and we pick up putting in the straps, placing them so I could still see the servicing stickers. That carbon fibre adapter was probably the most glamorous part of the job. It looked nice, it was fun to make and it was really easy to access. But now we move on to some of the more hard to reach places. Next up, installing the new nozzles. And one of the reasons this ended up being a bigger job is that the old system only had two nozzles in place. The new system comes with five. And according to the manual, not only do I have to use all five, but I have to put them in the locations pictured. And that's two in the cockpit, spraying back towards my lap, and three in the engine compartment, two coming from the side and one coming from the back. So what does this look like on my actual car? In the cockpit, I plan to add the nozzles as you see them here, and that should give me a nice even spray pattern all over me, instead of just the engine bay like it is now. Around the engine, you can't see them in this shot, but there's two nozzles on the very far left and right hand corners. And that should provide a reasonable spray over the exhaust and the sides of the engine. But the manual calls for the installation of a third nozzle, and I reckon the best place is on the underside of this structure that supports the roll hoop, because then I can cover the other side of the engine and very importantly the fuel rail. It's hard to see here, but there's already some nozzle plates welded into place, so installing the new nozzles here is pretty straightforward. Well, it is at least on the left hand side, because the right hand side is a lot, lot harder to reach. To the point where it's almost impossible to get your fingers in, and I ended up 3D printing a specialist little arm just to hold the back of the nozzle and get it in place so I could put the front nut on. But no such brackets existed for the other three nozzles, so I was going to have to make my own. The next thing I designed and printed was this little jig to help me drill into the chassis. The diameter matched this vertical section, and it had a flat so it could rotate against the sheet metal next to it and get the right angle. And this allowed me to drill pilot holes on equal heights and angles on both sides, which I then expanded to a larger hole before introducing the rib nut tool and installing a nice shiny M6 fitting on both sides. The next part was a prototype bracket to hold the nozzles. These versions were just 3D printed, and it took me three iterations before I was happy with the angle of the nozzle. There was no way I was drilling into the roll hoop support, so I designed this nylon bracket that would slip over the top and then have another aluminium mount bolted to it. I'm fully expecting people to tell me that I shouldn't 3D print race car components. The instructions state I can use nylon for mounting parts of the system, and as you can see from this version that came off the bed, it's amazingly durable, plus it has plenty of thermal resistance for where it will be located. If nylon is good enough for cable ties, then it's definitely good enough for my chunky bracket that's going to live in the same place. And on top of that, for my main channel, I've interviewed people in professional motorsports teams. And I know for a fact that they 3D print components that both live on the car, as well as 3D printing prototypes that later become metal parts, which was really cool to see. The final nozzle support brackets would be milled from aluminium. I translated the dimensions into a flat version for machining, and I also designed these little jigs for helping me bend to the right angle. For making these nozzle brackets, I once again used the Carvera desktop CNC. I've got a link in the description to check it out. I'm a big fan and it's pretty much the perfect CNC for these type of projects. After peeling the mounting tape off the parts, like usual, they look absolutely perfect. The only scratches you see here are the ones I already had on the material before I started. My 3D printed bending jig support also fit perfectly. 
I used it to clamp my machined brackets to the bench, and then bit by bit I used a flat piece of MDF to bend the bracket towards the correct angle, which I repeatedly checked with my 3D printed guide. This was pretty slow and steady, but the end result was great, because the two brackets had exactly the same angle, and once the stickers and adhesive were wiped off, and the nozzles installed, these were looking fantastic. The newly installed cabin nozzle sat exactly how I wanted. They pointed towards me, but not up in my face. And when looking from above, you can see they don't stick into the cabin, and they also don't encroach on any of the controls. What you're seeing here is a dummy assembly, just so you can envisage how this mounts over the roll hoop support above the engine. The nylon hoop slips over the bar, I then bolt on the aluminium bracket, and then I tension the center bolt to flex the clamp closed and prevent it from sliding around. And I'm pleased to say it worked absolutely perfectly. And in the unlikely event something turns out going wrong with this, I can always machine a variant out of metal. The nozzles looked pretty and all, but they're pretty useless until they're connected to the actual tank. So the next step was to install some hose. This stuff has a thin metal interior with a hard plastic coating and that makes it quite flexible. There's T pieces in the kit to help you split the path to the nozzle and you need to cut the tube with one of these pipe cutters to not leave any jagged edges that damage the fittings. Finally, I got some P-clips that would complement the use of cable ties in holding the tube to the chassis. Fast forward to the end, and the combination of all these parts ended up looking quite neat, but I didn't film that much of the installation as that really would have slowed me down. However, I did film the making of this short segment just to show you my process. Firstly, I would use the protective sleeve to work out the length of the tube that I needed. I would then translate that over to the pipe, and then return to the bench with the tube cutter to make the cleanest cut I could in the pipe. Where the pipe would have tight curves, I satisfied the minimum bend radius by bending the pipe around a socket. This gave me a uniform curve and removed any chance of kinks in the pipe. I would then make my final adjustments on the car after pushing one end to the nozzle and lining up everything for the matching T-piece. And this one you're seeing here was fiddly but still easily one of the easiest ones. I invite you to imagine how horrible it was working in this area of the engine bay to get to the furthest away nozzle. Once I knew the tube was correct, I would cut some sleeving to length, slide it over the tube and then use P-clips or cable ties to hold everything securely. Segment by segment, I was able to build up the entire system. And if you were concerned that my machined brackets might swivel up and down, once the hose is in the back of them, the whole thing becomes surprisingly rigid. It's hard for me to communicate the entire path of the tubing, but here goes. From the tank, it goes to the side of the cockpit, with a TP splitting towards the front, where it splits once more and then goes to each of the nozzles. The other end of the tube goes through a special fitting that came in the kit, passing through the sheet metal and then in front of the oil cooler back towards the engine bay. The engine bay side is even harder to see. It comes around the corner and splits up to the left hand nozzle, the other side travels up to the bulkhead, splits right, travelling across the width of the car to the right nozzle, and one of those earlier splits heads towards the back of the car only to find the centre and head upwards to the third nozzle. I hope you're still with me because we're on the home stretch. Only one part left, and that's the wiring between the power pack, extinguisher, and switch. I'm pretty sure the new and old electronics are identical, but I still thought it best to install the new one, and that would allow me to address some very questionable wiring on the previous install of the original system. To avoid the same dodgy spade connectors, and to ensure everything was waterproof, I went with this two-pin Deutsch connector. I then kept things tidy with plenty of heat shrink. I was happy with the position of the original control box, so I installed the new one in exactly the same spot. And the circuit for wiring is really straightforward. One cable to the tank, one cable to the box, we bridge the two blue wires, and then the two brown wires go to our switch. With everything plugged in and insulated, we can finally test the new system. With the control box switch in the neutral position, testing the trigger button rightly illuminates the test LED. And before going on track, I would switch it to armed, and then any press is going to set off the system. Installation done with a series of small and mostly straightforward steps. And that means one of the bigger items from the to-do list is now crossed off. I just have to remember to put on the external stickers once the body panels are back in place. And that's it, one of the bigger items ticked off the list, which means I can now move on to a series of smaller jobs, and hopefully it won't be too long before I have another video updating you on the progress, and hopefully it's not too long until I can finally drive this thing on the track for the first time. They say the best way to get a small fortune in motorsport is to start with a large one. If it sounds good to you too, that I shouldn't have to sell semi-essential organs just to keep doing this, then consider becoming a sponsor, getting your business name or your head on the side of the car. Please get in touch.